of too many ads and dull, meaningless chat? We've got neither. Joy Drive. Smart, fun radio. Theatre, film, TV and more. Susie Rung reviews it all on Joy Drive. Happy New Year, Susie Rong. And it's so lovely to be back and happy 2024 to all our listeners, our Joy Drive family. I wish you lots of happiness and joy. Oh. But above all of this, I wish you love and lots of prosperity in your pockets. How's that? I, I love it. It was That was almost like a Whitney Houston song. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a wise woman once said... <laughs> I have nothing original in my mind. (laughs) Hey, we just got a a couple of messages in. Welcome back, Susie. I really enjoy your perspective on film and television. That is uh, from Luke from Yarraville. There you go. Everyone's excited that you're back. We're all excited you're back. Good. I'm excited about today's show. I thought this was an interesting one today. Oh, okay. So we're talking about Good Grief, which is um, you can currently stream it on Netflix. I watched it. Last night, I know a few people here in the office watched it as well. Susie, what is it about? Finally, a Christmas movie for those of us who like our stories a bit darker and our humour just that little bit blacker. Good Grief appeared on Netflix Netflix last week, approximately 10 days after Christmas Day, presumably because the network didn't think it was entirely appropriate for the holiday season. The film starts with Mark and Oliver's extravagant party in their opulent London home, where we see, that, see them both very much in love and living the most glamorous life any person could dream of. Very quickly, though, Oliver is killed off, barely a block away, just as he leaves for a work trip in Paris. Mark is then left to pick up the pieces as we watch him go through a period of mourning his beloved husband. Luckily, Mark does have great friends, though. Sophie and Thomas offer excellent companionship. The bond between the the three is a godsend at this difficult time, but we discover that Sophie and Thomas are not without their own issues and can't be entirely relied upon to help Mark get back on his feet. Good Grief is written by, directed by, and stars Dan Levy of Schitt's Creek fame. Once more, this new film shows Levy to be a highly accomplished writer, creating something that is again so effortlessly captivating and enjoyable. There isn't a great moral or lesson really to learn from Good Grief, but there are more than a few occasions of deep and meaningful dialogue that will have you reflecting on some of the hardest times of your life and maybe come to an understanding of what you have learned from those experiences experiences. Levy's insightful observations about his character in a moment of catastrophe are, in my opinion, quite a cathartic watch. It's otherwise a fairly simple film, nicely put together with Levy's immense charisma in the central role really helping to sustain our attention. His irrepressible comic appeal means that the show never gets as sad as it probably should, but that also ensures that viewers are kept entertained. Warren, they're all very shiny, privileged people, Mm. but somehow quite... Quite relatable, no? Oh, the only reflecting I did was looking in the mirror and wondering whether I should pick that pimple, to be honest. I didn't... didn't. Oh, no, did you get bored? (laughs) I was bored. I was so bored. Honestly, I I watched the show and it it was... I I stopped it because I wanted to see how far through it was, which I think I did so many times. And I was about halfway through and I thought... I felt like I was still setting the scene. I just didn't... I just didn't get the depth of the show. It did, I couldn't get into it at all. I didn't, I don't know, I don't know what the message was it was trying to get across with. It was talking about grief or, you know, talking about open relationships. I couldn't get into it, Susie. I really tried. I watched the whole show. I absolutely watched the whole show, but just couldn't, couldn't. And, uh, you know, a couple of people here were the same. They were like, well, <laughs> I want to go to bed. No, I didn't work I, I did think that I did think that it started on the wrong foot. I, I think that starting with so much opulence just didn't mm. put you on their side. Like like when the guy died, you're like, I don't care. I, I do I do get that. I do get that. Um I also get that Dan Levy's sort of like he has so much comedy in him and mm. like he's not able to kind of get into the sadness of it which I think uh, also detracts from what the story could have given so I get that Like, and I think because I've chatted with I've known you for these last two years and I kind of know how how you respond to these things I had a quite a distinct feeling that, that you would 
that this film was going to leave you a bit cold. Yeah, it did, it did a little bit. I, I, I mean, I think grief is such an important thing that we need to talk about and and unpack, and it's particularly in movies. But I just don't think it did it any justice whatsoever. And you know, and the whole thing about the friends having other issues and oh, I just I couldn't see what the big deal was like the friends went out they went to Paris and you know a few things happened like so what they went and had fun they <laughs> slept with someone like we all do it like what's the big deal what's the significance in that I couldn't get it it went straight over my head I was like I don't know what they've done wrong but they're acting as though they've you know murdered someone <laughs> That's one of those things like Dan Levy, I think, is he is a huge talent, but he is ultimately, you know, what we call the Nepo baby, right? He's mm. born into a Hollywood family, so he, ah. he does have a lot of privilege. And you can see it like, you know, he doesn't really feel like he's ever experienced a lot of hardship in his life. But, um, you know, I think in that way, uh, he's, he's not able to kind of express kind of, a, um, you know, that, that, that sort of catastrophe that most of us feel, or he's not able to express it in a way that, that is, you know, quite, re- quite relatable, I guess. But I, I thought some of his observations were good, you know, that stuff about how, how your heart, uh, needs to heal. You know, the way he expresses how, how a kind of a tough, a bad relationship stops you from loving uh, you know, in the future, if you're not careful. Well, that's true. Yeah, and also, yeah. I suppose his his look at grief um, and the fact that I, we, you know, we tell ourselves lies and you know we go into denial just so that we can continue to move forward. And you know, I look at some of the you know I've lost family members close to me in my life, like we all have. But um, if I look at my brother in particular, you know, I convinced myself that life must go on and blah, blah, blah. And then it wasn't, you know, this was in the 1980s that he passed away. And it wasn't until Mm. probably the last 10 years that I grieved him. You know, it hit me. And Mm. I thought, you can tell yourself these lies and you can suppress it and do all this sort of stuff, but it bubbles up eventually and comes and gets you. You have to process it. Well, but it seems that it's how humans work. Like, Mm. sometimes these feelings are so big that the only way to deal with them um, is to lie and to lie to yourself and to pretend put yourself in a state of delusion um, obviously is harmful in itself but it's probably protecting you from you know the the, the immense the immense uh, emotions that that otherwise you your body is not able to cope with and I think that is one of the things right like as we grow older we find that oh those things that we have packaged away um, compartmentalized and tucked away for years um, they kind of don't really go away but no. you do as a person grow stronger you know as you grow older you have more kind of you have more um uh, you you have you have more strength to be able to deal with those things and then if you are if you you know if you have enough wisdom you might be able to unpackage those things and deal with them uh you know now that the time has passed and hopefully you'll be able to deal with them better and then come out of it better because i think a lot of that compartmentalization like you said you know they 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 help you through a certain time when you were a uh, weaker perhaps um but but they kind of cause you different sorts of problems um and then with maturity you should be able to look at them but you know i think most of us do need help on that front it's very hard to do do those things on your own exactly and i wonder how much there's an intersection between you know we're we're good at hiding ourselves aren't we and masking ourselves and not showing the true selves and I wonder how much of that intersects with when it does come to grief you know we're sort of experts at doing that aren't we whether we also therefore mask that as well and go you know what you know I don't need to grieve it or I can hide that grief I don't know I don't know what the answer is but I wonder if that does come into play as well and therefore it's kind of easy for us to do and to just get on with things sometimes than necessarily grieve i don't know maybe that, re- that maybe reminds me of the word the word resilience that people always use to mm. describe gay and trans people you know like yes you have the resilience because the world has treated you terribly and then as a from even from as a child you you, you cope you develop these coping mechanisms and then you can apply these coping mechanisms to anything you know you you, you know how to deal with all this hardship which is which i know is a it's a good thing because life is hard no matter who you are and if you if you have the ability to deal with those things that's a great thing but if if it, if it puts you in a state of constant denial and you're never mm. honest about about things we know that to be unhealthy you know and, and to the extent that i you know I, I i've heard of i know of people who have developed physical illnesses 
I Ooh. think as a result of those things, uh, um, you know, it, th- this is sort of a little bit metaphysical, but I do think there is a correlation. Like if you, if you don't have an ability to look at your real emotions um, and, and you've, you've put them away for too long, they manifest in really unhealthy ways. So we have to be careful with this resilience, even though that, you know, even though we, it is a gift for us. Susie, are you there? I'm here. Oh, Can good. You Sorry, me? I thought I'd lost you for a second. Something else uh, I wanted to chat about, and look, and I know, and uh, those who are in open relationships, I know there are good ones and there are healthy ones, and uh, they work really well, and they've discussed their boundaries and how they work, and that's great. And I know they they happen, but I just want to talk to you, Susie, because the ones I come across, and this is something that uh, happens in the movie, it strikes me that one of the person tends to, uh, one of the partners tends to agree to the open relationship because they feel like they could potentially lose the other partner or they're lesser than the other partner or the other partner might be good looking and they're too good you know good catch and what have you and i, I know that that's what was um that's what he said in the movie as well um when he admitted to agreeing to <laughs> yeah. the open relationship and i wonder i mean you know i'm gonna get personal with you susie you know i was with someone on the weekend and, uh, you know, we're having a bit of fun and uh, his phone rings. He goes, oh, it's my partner. I was, what? Because <laughs> it's my partner. <laughs> and uh, we have an open relationship, but he gets really jealous and uh, insecure <laughs> because I just had an affair. And I said, what? What? Why? Hang on a hang on a, <laughs> hang on a minute. Why are you here with me when this poor person is feeling insecure and jealous? And I instantly stopped and said, no, this, this isn't on. He goes, oh, well, I think it's probably coming to an end anyway. And, you know, oh, you're gorgeous. Maybe we should hang out more. I was like, what is going, this is not, a, this is not an equal open relationship. This is like torture for the other person, <laughs> you know? And then if I look at another one, um, that I, I was seeing a guy who was married and I didn't know he was married. And then I found out he was married. And, and then, you know, the, the married guy's tracking this guy. And the only way I could catch up with him was because he had to, you know, to leave his phone at home. So he didn't know he was with me. And they're saying, oh, no, but we've got agree, agreed open relationships. So I don't know. I just... <laughs> Look, you know, one, one point I want to say is Dan Levy's film might not have been very entertaining to you but clearly <laughs> there, was, there were some observations <laughs> yeah it got you, like he's really good at these kind of really minute observations but as a storyteller you know there, there are things that can be improved i i feel like you know i understand the world uh from a different place like i've not been in a relationship for over 15 years mm. and i am the last person to give any one relationship advice but i can tell you that relationships are just really really hard and, mm. and you know people who make who make it work or seem to make it work i'm always very like i'm always very, very suspicious i'm like i don't really believe it um <laughs> just just because just because the, the the human condition is especially when it's two men right like the the amount of horniness in there i don't know how you contain it and and not just the horniness but the other side of it that that that's kind of tendency to get bored with people yeah i, that's d- true. I don't know but, how but, but when does it but where do you cross the line where it becomes lies and deceit and almost you know abuse of the other partner where they're feeling uncomfortable yeah, and insecure yeah. i mean to me so that's now not now, pe- nice now people are trying now people are trying to be open and trying to be honest and trying to take like cheating out of the equation by saying that well if there is no if there is no uh, traditional commitment then there is no cheating right like if if you understand that once in a while or you know maybe more often than that I'm going to see other people uh, that if you know that that's my condition that means that that is not cheating but like the film shows and like like you've expressed you know it's not a hundred percent uh a hundred percent um safe strategy because someone's still going to feel uh feel jealous someone's still going to feel like uh, that there is something wrong and then and then you know and more often than not the other person's going to say oh the relationship is coming to an end that still happens um i don't know relationships are hard i don't like it don't ask me about it i don't know how to do it <laughs> i tell you what Susie, the more I, the more i'm knowing you I, i'm quite happy being by myself i'm finding it a lot easier <laughs> I think you. I think by osmosis, you know, you've you've uh, influenced us. It's probably a lot of us like that. You know what? I, I think that relationships are great. You know, I, I wish that if I wish that I had someone that would 
uh, that would have, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, sort of semi-traditional relationship. I think financially, <laughs> financially, I'd be much more comfortable. And then, you know, I do get a- occasional bouts of set, uh, of loneliness. Mm. That's, that's normal. Um, but at the same time, I do think that it's important that we understand the emptiness of romance. That, that, that's something that I've learned, you know. I think, I don't know. I don't know if, if, if relationships can come out of a place that uh, where you are very uh, clear and honest about romance, that that how quickly it fades, how quickly lust and romance fades, and and how, what relationships look like beyond that, I don't know because I think so much of our our ideas and our conceptions about relationships are based on lust and romance, and we know those things don't last. So. I don't know. I don't know how that can be sustained beyond those, you know, honeymoon months or years, if you're lucky. And if you want to be honest about things, you know, like in this film, people want to be honest about things. So so they say, all right, we don't make that sort of old fashioned commitment. We call it an open relationship. But there's so much dissatisfaction. But the other Mm. thing is, too, like in this film, and we're talking about Good Grief, which you can stream on Netflix with uh, Susie Rong at the moment. Uh, You know, he finds out about his partner, you know, via... A, and I don't want to spoil it, but, you know, let's be honest, it's not exactly a uh, sit down and let's have an open and honest conversation that he finds out that there's someone else involved in the relationship as well. And I just think, I mean, when does an open relationship, be, where, like, where do you reach that point where you say, you know what, it's finished, it's ended, we don't need to go down the open path because you're just to hang on to it, just to say, you know what, let's keep it together because it's comfortable, because we're used to it, because we've got the dog, the kids, whatever, like, it's Ended. Let's just accept that and move on. And I wonder if that's what could have happened in this particular relationship in good grief, whether it had just ended. Uh, I think subsequently we found that that the the, the guy who died kind of imagined, right? Like the the, mm. the other the other person, the other man didn't quite see it as that serious. I don't think. But in any case, the quite your you know the you're bringing up the idea of when do you know where a relationship ends? That's a dangerous thing. I always have this thing where, oh, these, this, these uh, people, this couple has been together 20 something years. And I'm thinking, well, it's an impressive number, but how many, how much of those times are happy times? Mm. You know, I'd rather have been in a relationship that was shorter, but there were very, f- there too. were very few years that were miserable. Do you know what I honest. mean? Like there's so much. Yeah, there's so much credit given to people who are able to sustain a really, really long relationship. But, uh, you know, the, the emphasis should be on people who have had happy relationships, even if they, they were short. So when people tell me that they are, they, they have divorced or they're broken up, I always say congratulations. <laughs> because. Great. Great. You don't have any more miserable days. A couple of texts. Uh, Johnny just said, as a single person, I think the rules of someone else's is their business, not mine. I agree. But I don't engage with people when I feel their rules are causing toxic vibes. That's right. But what happens, Johnny, when you find out about their rules when you're in the middle of seeing someone? Because that's what happened to me. Susie, I'm not joking. I just got a text. In- does, that, does that mean that you always have a... Uh, quite a lot of expectation from your encounters it sounds that it sounds like you kind of do think that oh it it sounds like you you do take your encounters sort of more uh serious well, than, I do, than, but I find than what i find is, is is people reveal that they're in a relationship often later on um and i get really annoyed at that because um ah. You know, if you know up front things are different, you set your expectations different. But uh, when they're with you and they're going, oh, this is amazing and we should catch up more, et cetera, et cetera, and I love the chemistry, et cetera, and then, oh, by the way, I've got a partner. It's like, well, <laughs> why did you want to go down that path in the first place without revealing? By the way, I've got a partner. Yeah. That, 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 comes up, that comes up later? Later. That's the thing. Like, why, not, why aren't people just up front in the beginning? What, is this going to be something that you can ask someone on a first date? Or is that inappropriate on a first date? Do you know, Susie, as we're talking on air, I, air, I just got a message saying, hey, you're free tonight from the one that was on the weekend. <laughs> I, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Susie, wrong. I love our conversations. And uh, I just want to say, you know, we do know that some people have really healthy, open relationships. As we're just talking about our experience. Uh, like any advice, this is not advice. It is just Susie and I <laughs> chatting. We are not giving you relationship <laughs> advice whatsoever. It's just our personal experiences. So please take it with a grain of salt. We're talking about um, 
What's it called? Good, good Grief. Good Grief. Which is on, on Netflix. Netflix. Susie, what are we doing for next week? It's a relationship. Alan related. Carr. Alan Carr is a national treasure, not just of the UK, but also for lovers of camp humour everywhere. The series about his childhood, Changing Ends, has finally arrived in Australia. So make sure you see it all on ABC iView. And we'll have a chat about Changing Ends when I see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Susie. That's Susie Rong. And, of course, we're talking about Good Grief, which is on Netflix. Joy Drive on Joy 94.9 FM in Melbourne, Joy on your digital radio, iHeartRadio, TuneIn.com or the Joy app. No matter where you are.